is Miss Sonia Brown, who comes to you with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Carol. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Elizabeth. And welcome, welcome all of you. I'm happy to be here and to share with you this morning. This past Sunday, as I sat at my dining table thinking about the theme for this morning's message, I went into meditation and the thought came to me, my dependency is on God. My dependency is on God. At first I thought to myself, dependency. I decided to consult the dictionary and found the following meanings for dependency. A subject territory. Something dependent. Dependence. And the meanings for dependence? The state of relying on someone or something for aid, support, or the like, reliance or trust. So then, affirming that my dependence is on God is saying that I am God's subject territory. I rely on God for my aid, my support, and I trust and rely on God. Who or what is this God? In the Bible we read that God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then in this teaching we define God as spirit or the creative energy which is the cause of all visible things. It is love, wisdom, intelligence, power, substance, mind. The truth which is real, the principle which is dependable. Further, we teach that we are created by God, spirit, in its image and likeness, and that we come from this one source, this one spirit, which is eternal. It stands to reason then that being created in its image and likeness, we have been created as spirit with the creative energy, which is the invisible cause behind all visible things. My dependency is on spirit. The creative energy, which is the cause of all visible things, I am a subject of this creative energy spirit. What does this mean? Does it mean that we do nothing and wait for manna to fall from the skies? I think not. I believe that what it means is that we recognize God, the source, spirit, from which we all originate as our provider of all things visible and invisible. It means that whatever we perceive as our need, we go to that spirit within and allow it to guide us in the way to achieve it. Too often when we want something, we start thinking about how to get it, planning in our human ways. We allow the five senses and our biases and prejudices gained from the world to guide us. Manipulating, seeking advice from various persons without first going to God. Then when our striving and manipulation don't work, we give up in frustration. 
New Thought Mystic and Teacher of Teachers, Emma Curtis Hopkins, tells us in Class Lessons of 1888, and here I quote, the impulse or instinct to lean upon something to make us happy is a sign that something will make us happy, yet nothing that we have leaned upon has made us well or happy. So as the sign, that is the impulse or instinct, my insertion, never fails to be true, it shows we have not leaned on the right thing. Why? Because although being spirit, we have leaned upon matter for health, being mind, we have looked to physical things for satisfaction. We have not paid attention to the imperative command heard over all the rush and noise of our dealings with our fellow beings. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth." End of quote. Friends, what this is telling us is that when we feel an impulse to be or do something, it is a sign that the resources the potential for us to bring whatever the impulse is into manifestation is available, although it may not be visible to us at that time. We would not get the urge to express in that manner if the resources to make it possible did not already exist in the invisible. However, we have been conditioned to look to outer things to bring this about instead of relying on spirit to guide us. Instead of listening to what our spirit is telling us, we have listened to what seem to be the rational human ways to bring things about. Then, when things don't work as we had expected, we say we should have listened to spirit. So many times we have heard the imperative command of spirit and not obeyed it. Why do we do this? I think it is because our socialization has to a certain extent moved us out of alignment with spirit. We have been socialized to depend on outer means of accomplishing things with, without first going within to spirit to have it guide us as to what steps to take. However, if we accept that our true dependency is on God, spirit, the creative energy of the universe, it becomes necessary to become realigned with spirit. I remember Reverend Elmo telling us a story about someone who was facing a challenge. I can't recall exactly what the challenge was. <clears throat> However, whatever the challenge, the person took all what he or she considered to be the rational human steps to handle the challenge, but was unable to solve it. Discussing the situation with someone, he or she said in frustration, the only thing left to do now is pray. <laughs> the person to whom he or she was speaking responded, you mean it come to that? In other words, prayer was being considered as a last resort and was only being considered because all known human methods and strategies had failed. Friends, this is no way to go through life. Instead of using prayer as a last resort, prayer should be the initial step in everything. Instead of the situation coming to that, it should start with that. Whatever the need, whatever the impulse, first go within. Joel Goldsmith, a 20th century mystic, in the book, Spiritual Interpretation of Scripture, tells us, 
Prayer is not what goes from the individual to God, but that which comes from God. The universal to the individual consciousness, end of quote. That which comes from the universal to the individual consciousness. This is why we should aim to take everything to the universal consciousness. For out of that consciousness comes the answers, the steps, the guidance that we need. Mr. Goldsmith continues, prayer is the word of God which comes to you in silence. Emma Curtis Hopkins tells us, and here I quote, stick to the word of truth. Talk about it as already here, although no one may see it. You shall receive. It is the law of the externalizing power of the word. You may speak it silently or audibly. If you speak it audibly, people may think you are mad or foolish. It is better to speak these things in the silence to avoid controversy." End of quote. I laughed when I read people may think you are mad or foolish because I thought to myself that this is so true. So often when one does things differently from how the major majority of persons would or from what is commonly regarded as the right way to approach something, one is often described as mad or crazy. However, that person may be listening to his inner guidance. And do you know what? When he does this, everything falls into place in divine right order to bring about the desired manifestation. The master teacher Jesus taught us to be dependent on God. When his disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, what did he do? He gave them what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. How does this prayer begin? It starts, our Father which art in heaven. Who is a father? A father is someone who is involved in our creation. On the human level, we bear the genes of our human father. And to extrapolate, then on the spiritual level, we bear the genes of our spiritual father. We bear the genes of that from which we came. We are spirit. We are creative energy. We teach that heaven is within. Therefore, our spiritual father, God, creative energy, is right within us. The science of my textbook tells us the kingdom of heaven is unformed, unlimited, unconditioned. It is the real state of being. We do not make it real, for it is eternal reality. Think about it, friends. Our Father, God is within. Unformed, unlimited, unconditioned. As unconditioned creative energy, spirit, it is able to bring about an infinite variety of forms, an infinite variety of answers, an infinite variety of solutions. The finite mind is unable to achieve this, so in all things, go within to spirit. Hallowed be thy name. Sacred and holy is thy name, pure, unfettered, free. Thy will be done. When we place our dependence on this sacred one, the pure, unconditioned will of God becomes manifest. Not the will of some person whose will has been conditioned by the prejudices and biases of the race, but the pure, free, unconditioned will of our spiritual father doing his will, that is listening to pure spirit and doing what it tells us to do 
allows the kingdom to manifest on earth. That is, brings the answers, the solutions into manifestation. The reading from Richard Living for April 21 starts with this sentence, I am the agent of the eternal. When we put our dependence on God, when we surrender to the will of God, we are acting as the agent of the eternal, not the agent of some well-intentioned person, but the agent of the eternal. That is why we listen to the promptings of our heart. We go within, we listen, and we follow the guidance which comes through us to allow ourselves to be agents of the eternal. This, friends, is practicing the presence. Give us this day our daily bread. When we bring ourselves into alignment with spirit, we can speak our word with authority because we know we are following the dictates of spirit. If we put our dependence on people, place, or thing instead of on spirit, we are unable to speak with authority because then we are interfering with someone else's choice and we are not assured of their commitment to us. Joel Goldsmith tells us in the book, Our Spiritual Resources, and here I quote, once we cease looking to a person for anything, for gratitude, payment, recognition, or commendation, usually it flows to us in abundant measure. We withhold it from ourselves by expecting it. And we set up a wall of defense in husband or wife, child, parent, or friend by the very act of expecting something from him or her. Whereas, if we were to set everyone completely free and expect our good from the one source, we would then find that our husband, wife, child, parent, and neighbor would be bringing us their gifts with open hands." End of quote. We are yet reminded of the need to place our dependence on God and not on man in the Bible story found in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5, where we read, New Revised Standard Version. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take up your mat, and walk. And once the man was made well, and he took up his bed, he began to walk. In this story, we see evidence of dependence on others to do something for us, as well as victim consciousness. I don't have anybody to put me into the pool. Every time somebody gets ahead of me. However, we also see in Jesus' question to the man, compassion. And because Jesus had embodied the Christ consciousness, he was able to speak with authority and command the man to take up his mat and walk. Jesus was the channel for the Christ consciousness to reveal itself so that the man could get up and walk. The Metaphysical Bible Dictionary tells us that Jerusalem signifies the spiritual center in consciousness. 
the pool of Bethesda symbolizes that place in consciousness where we feel the flow of the cleansing life of the spirit. The sheep gate represents the channel through which the natural innocent expression of spiritual life flows. The five porticos represent the five sense limitation of the human mind. The man was therefore depending on someone to take him out of his sense of limitation and raise him to that place in consciousness, the pool of Bethesda, where he would feel the flow of the cleansing life of the spirit. The man had been ill for 38 years and no one had done this for him. Why? I believe this is telling us that each of us has to do the work himself. Each of us has to get to that place in consciousness where we feel the flow of spirit. There is a twist to the story, however, as it was the authority conveyed by Jesus the Master, having himself fully embodied his Christ's nature that brought about the healing. Jesus was the agent of the eternal. Jesus so let his light shine that the man was able to recognize that light and come to his sense of realization that he was made perfect, whole, and complete. I believe the messages we can take from this victim are, there is no need to be a victim. Our expectation and dependence should be on God. If persons are to assist, that is, to be agents of God, those persons will be guided to do what they need to do. We don't need to coerce or manipulate. When we go to spirit, we leave the five limiting senses behind. We allow spirit to guide us. Friends, the Father Spirit has ways and means that we know not of. As we embody the Christ consciousness, our light shines and we are light to our world. Friends, there is a process that we have to go through to get to that stage where we are so fully aligned with spirit that practicing the presence becomes first nature. For most of us, it does not happen overnight. It takes commitment and the constant practice of going within. I believe that the more we meditate, the more we become attuned to the promptings of spirit within us. The more we consciously and consistently listen to spirit and act as it guides us, the more it becomes natural and easy. It becomes our first nature and we are realigned with spirit. And once we have the courage to start acting as prompted by spirit and do this consistently, we get to the stage where no matter what is going on in the outer, we are able to go within and feel the peace which passes understanding and let go and let God. We get to that stage where we surrender to spirit and forget the prejudices, prejudices and biases of the world. Friends, there is an affirmative prayer of surrender in this month's Science of Mind magazine. It was done by Tracy Brown, a religious science practitioner who serves on the leadership council of Centers for Spiritual Living. I would like us to together read this treatment of joyful surrender and understand and recognize that once we surrender, it's, we let go, we let God, and we allow God to manifest in our lives and affairs. So together, there is an infinite intelligence that creates and expands all of life. 
This infinite intelligence is a source of all good and the example of perfect wisdom. It knows exactly what to do, when to do it, and who to include in the never-ending expansion of love and life. My life is a product of this infinite intelligence, and I have been created in its image. Therefore, immeasurable intelligence and the deepest wisdom are already and always within me. I know that I am fully equipped to handle any and every situation I experience. I refuse to be distracted by doubt, fear, anger, or confusion. I know there is no experience, no person, and no action that can block me from the intelligence within. I choose right now to turn away from old stories and false beliefs. I choose right now to drop all illusions and false pretense. I choose to step into the unknown, knowing I am guided, guarded, and protected by spirit. I surrender willingly. I surrender completely. I know that surrender is not giving up to hopeless despair. Surrender is simply releasing the delusion that I am in control and allowing the divine to guide me every thought and action. Surrender is a joyful release, knowing I am fully supported and every need is being met. I surrender to love that has no boundaries. I surrender to the wisdom of a higher power that never makes mistakes. I surrender into the life that has no limits. And with the deepest gratitude for all that is, I take a breath. I completely release. And so it is. Friends, our dependency is on God. Namaste.